Good morning, TC. Let's give it up for Jesus one more time all across this place. We're so excited, all of you guys online, everyone in the room, and we are pumped that you guys are with us. And we're in the Taking Ground series, and today I want to talk to you about bridge builders. And how many of you guys remember growing up in school, and they talked to you about, like, uh, like the Newton's laws and all that stuff? Anybody remember? I was like, I remember them talking about it. I don't really remember it, but I remember them talking about it, right? And so a couple of those just to help you out in case maybe you've forgotten over the last six months since you graduated or six years. or And we'll just stop. We'll just stop there. Okay. And uh, Newton's Law is one of the first ones. Like For every action, there's an equal and opposite. Re- okay. Right? So you guys, you guys are with me. So, for example, the joy that I get when I buy a new pair of shoes is an equal and opposite reaction of the hard time my wife gives me because I bought a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Okay, so like equal but opposite reaction, <laughs> all right? Um, but the, the, the other one is an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion unless it is acted upon by an outside source. You guys remember that? All right? For some of us, I think we understand this in the science, but we fail to understand it in the spirit, right? Right? Because here's how many of us are looking for God to move in our lives. You ready? I'm going to keep doing it this way, but I'm expecting God to show up this way. And at some point, how many guys know if we're looking for God to do something new and different, we've got to start doing something new and different. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. We're going to go to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And we're going to hit chapter one first, but then we're going to jump to chapter three, okay? And and. In the book of Joshua, the Israelites are getting ready to finally go into their promised land. So they've been wandering around for a long time in the desert. And they're finally getting ready to go to the promised land. And this is what it says. Be strong, verse 7 of chapter 1. It says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it, then, say then, say it like you believe it, then, all right, if you're at home, say it to your cat, and then kick it out, okay, no, I'm just kidding, then you will be prosperous and successful, And I want you to understand something because everywhere in the Bible where God starts making promises, all of God's promises have a contingency to it. So like when you do this, God says, I do this. So so God has invited us into a partnership, which is part of a covenant because we serve a covenantal God. So God makes covenants with people and then he acts on his covenants that he has with his people. And so If you do these things, then I do these things, right? So it's a conditional promise. So what we have to do when God makes a conditional or a covenantal promise, we have to look at what's before that to understand how we get to what's after that. Does that make sense? So if I buy new shoes without telling my wife, then there's a problem. But if my wife goes to Target without telling me, then there's no problem. I'm not going to lie to you. It It is what it is. I've accepted it. It's just the life we live, okay? If and then, okay? Proverbs 29, 18, in the message paraphrase, it says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, what he wants for their life, what he wants to do in their life, they're blessed, right? Some, some of you grew up with a, maybe a different translation where it says, Without, where there is no vision, people perish, right? The word blessed, say blessed, the word blessed comes from the word barakah in the Bible. And what it means is that it, when you're blessed, according to what the word says, it means you're, you're kneeling under the open hand of God and he's reserving nothing. He's pouring everything out. 
So I want you to think about this for a second. You're, you're, you're kneeling, you're, you're coming to God, and, and you've done all the things. And now that you've done all the things, you're, you're kneeling under the open hand of God. And so here we are, God, I, I just want what you want for my life, and I'm going to do everything you've called me to do. And God says, all right, since, since, you're, since you're asking and since you're committing, and now we're in covenant, I'm going to release everything to you. So I'm opening my hands for you, and everything I have for you is yours. I'm reserving nothing. How many guys would love to walk in that kind of life? How many of you guys have walked in the other kind of life where you feel like, I don't know if I'm getting everything here? Right? So there's an if and a then. And I want to help you out today. I am not t- just talking about finances, although we will talk about finances. When I'm talking about blessed, I'm talking about a blessed life. How many of you guys remember when Pastor Dan was preaching? He was talking about he didn't always get money in his mailbox, but what he got was favor and blessings and people coming through and people showing up in his life. And, and it didn't look like a check all the time, but what it looked like is when God's favor is on our life, God shows up in miraculous ways. And so when we come to TC, we believe that the whole Bible is a covenant that God wants to have for us. But here's the thing that I think is, is important. We have to understand as Christians, how many guys know there's a difference between situational circumstances and living in principle in your circumstances. What I mean by that is this. How many guys have ever met someone that they were this type of person when the circumstances were right, but when the circumstances weren't right, they changed? How many guys have ever met someone, they said they, they said they acted like this, but when the circumstances weren't right, they started kind of acting like this. So we, got, we have situational people, but then we have principle people. That it doesn't matter how many guys know someone, it doesn't matter who they're around, they're the same person no matter who they're around. That's why I say, you get around me, we're going to laugh, we're going to make fun of someone, and we're going to eat well. So, like, if you can't get down with that, you don't want to be around. Okay, <laughs> like, same person all the time. So, the question we have to understand is, we need to realize God's not situational, he's based on principle. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today. And forever, right? And so, what do we do? I want to talk to you today about being a bridge builder. Because how many guys know what you sow, you reap? Right? Take it out of the finance world and put it in somewhere else for a second. How many guys have been around people, they're happy all the time, and when people get around them, they get happy? Y'all, you can think of someone right now, can't you? You get around them, you're like, why are you so happy all the time? They're like, I'm just happy. And you're like, I'm happy too then. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, they never have a bad day. I just want to be around them. But how many of y'all been around people that only have bad days? See? See? You already are like, don't, I don't even, I don't, I can't. Right? Why? You get out of it what you put into it. You show smiles, you get smiles. You walk around with a frown, people frown back. So we, so we, we get what we put out. So I want to talk to you today about bring a, uh, being a bridge builder because there's, we need to be a bridge builder between where you are and where God wants you to be. Listen to me. Between where you are and where God wants you to be. There's a difference between who you are and who God wants you to be. There's a difference between the life you're living and the life God wants you to live. There's a difference between the impact you're making and the impact God wants you to make. There's a difference between what you have and what God wants you to have. There's a difference between where you are and where God wants you to be. And hear me, God desires for you to be the person in your family, in your life, everywhere that you touch, God wants you to be a person that bridges the gap between where you are and where God wishes you were. God wants you to be the person that bridges the gap between where your family is and where God wants your family to be. God wants you, look at your neighbor and say you. Come on, look at him, say you like you believe it. God wants you to be the person that bridges the gap between where you are and where God wants your life to be. But hear me, someone's got to bridge the gap because an object at rest stays at rest. In the spirit world, a person going nowhere continues to go nowhere. And a person pressing into God continues to press into God unless it's acted on by an outside foot. Unless you do something different, you will stay the same. How many guys want something different for you, for your children, for your children's children, for the legacies that are after you? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So in the book of Joshua, we see 
that Joshua's preparing the people. So he says, oh, God says, all right, Joshua, do this. And so we get ready, and we're going to Joshua 3 now. And, and as we get ready to do that, we want to see how Joshua is saying, all right, we go into chapter 3, and God's saying, all right, get ready because you're about to go. You're about to move. Turn your neighbor and say, move. And I want to give you a few things that you need to understand before you start moving. Number one, you got to realize that God's direction always seems counterintuitive, but so is his favor. How many guys have ever had God tell you something and you're like, that don't seem to make sense at all? God's like, Here, here's, one, here's my favorite. Love your neighbor. Better yet, love your enemy. Try again, God. Right? Pray for those that despitefully use you. Right? How, do you, how many of you guys have a hard time with the turn the other cheek one? Like, I usually don't let people get two shots at me. You know what I'm talking about? See, some of y'all grew up in Sunday school, but some of us grew up in the hood. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I went to the hood. I didn't grow up there. Okay. But anyway, so all that is say, give and you'll get more. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Practice a Sabbath. Here's a, pra- only work, only have six days a week to work. Take one day off and I'll give you more in six days. And you, I'll give you more in six than you could have gotten seven. Doesn't make sense. Tithe. Give God 10%, live off the 90, and God will make 90% go more than you could have made 100% go. It doesn't make sense. Listen to me. God's direction always seems counterintuitive, but so is his favor. Because when God shows up with favor for our life, the blessed open hand of God life, things work when we can't figure out how they work. Right? Joshua 3, 2 through 3, it says this. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. They said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. Listen, I want to help you understand something. The Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God was held. And I want to help you understand something in your life. Where the God is moving, that's where you want to be every time. God, I really feel like I want to be over here. No, no, no. You want to be wherever God wants you to be. Because wherever God is at, God's favor is at. How many of you guys have ever gotten outside of the plan of God for your life? And you knew it. You dated that person. You got into that relationship. You spent that money. And it didn't take all of two minutes. And you are like, oh, my gosh. This person is crazy. They put pineapple on pizza. I'm just kidding. But, okay. Anyways. Listen. But I think there's something important in the text. He said, God says, you've never gone this way before. See, you've moved with me before, but you've never gone this way before. And if we want to see God do new things, we're going to have to follow God in new directions. But if we're going to follow God in new directions and be obedient in new ways, we're going to have to follow God in a way we've never followed him before because he's going to take us down routes we've never gone before. And he's, he's, he's inviting the people saying, follow the Ark of the Covenant because you're going to need to know where I'm going. Listen, they've never gone this way before. I want to help you understand something. The Israelites were in the desert. When the Israelites were in the desert, there was water flowing out of a rock and manna from heaven falling down. You guys remember that? And so they, were, had, they had something to drink. They had something to eat. The presence of God. They were setting up the tent. Everything was gravy, right? How many guys know they could have just stayed there? Come on, help me out. How many guys know they could have just stayed there? They had water, they had food, they had annoying people, right? They had the presence of God. They had everything they needed to survive, listen to me, but there's a big difference between surviving and thriving. They had a promise land in front of them, but all they were committed to with the promise land in front of them, they, they were committed to it. They, they know they're going after it. So there, there's a promise land in front of them. Could they have chosen to just stay where they had enough? Or were they looking for something where there was so much more? And hear me, in your life, can you stay where you got water from a rock and manna falling? Yeah, you can. But is there so much more? Yes, there is. So why do we settle for water from a rock and and manna falling from heaven when God says, I want to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey? Now, in your life, that may look different than the person sitting next to you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God desires to drop a million dollars in every person's lap. What I'm saying is there's a life of blessing and favor that is available to everyone, and it looks different for everyone. But how many guys know blessing and favor from God is better than the best you can do on your own? 
And so we look for that. The difference between surviving and thriving is rooted in how much you, how much you let your faith determine your obedience. I'm going to say that again. The difference between surviving and thriving is determined by how much you let your faith dictate your obedience. When faith, all right, God, I'm believing you're going to do this, dictates my obedience. All right, God, because I believe you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. Even though it may not make sense, even though it's kind of counterintuitive, I'm going to do this. Hear me. That's where you go from surviving to thriving because now God's involved in the process, right? Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is a substance of things, what is it, that you can see all the time? No, hoped for. In other words, I don't know, but I'm hoping for it. Or the evidence of things I hadn't even seen yet. So, so when God moves us, it's counterintuitive. The second thing I want you to understand is that you need to recognize what your words are doing to your faith. And how your faith is impacting your obedience. You need to recognize what your words, say words, are doing to your faith and how your faith is impacting your obedience. Because how many guys know we'll wake up on Monday morning full of faith, but come Tuesday afternoon, anybody? Faith got a little, right? Like, how many guys know we'll, on Mon- Sunday after church, like, I'm ready to go through hell with a squirt gun, my man, Right? Come Monday lunchtime, that person at work done got to you. Your boss done asked you for the stupid stuff seven times. You done got eight meetings that could have been emails. Okay, we're all on the same page, right? So what's the reality? You got to recognize because when things start going differently, your words change, don't they? How many guys know your words change when things aren't going your way? You go from God, we got this to God, I don't know if you got this. Take it out of your work life and put it in your marriage, though. God, I, I know you're going to take care of our marriage, and somehow easily that turns into, God, I don't even know if you're going to do anything in this marriage. See how easy it is to let your words impact your faith? Joshua 3, 5, and Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So again, we're continuing the story in Joshua 3. So the Israelites got a promise. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. They've, they've been going at this for years. They're getting ready to go to the promised land. God says when the Ark of the Covenant gets ready to cross, there's a, there's a sea in front of them. This isn't the Red Sea. This is somewhere else. There's a sea in front of them. There's a, a body of water. They need to cross it. And God says, all right, when you get ready to cross it, the Ark of the Covenant is going to go first. Follow it because you're going to need to follow the presence of God to go to the promise of God. That's a word by itself, but you can write that down. So you, you you're going you're gonna to need to follow the presence of God to get to the promise of God. But hear me. He says, until then, verse 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Say consecrate. That word is the key to carrying God's favor. Why, why do they need to consecrate themselves? The word consecrate is to, to sanctify, to purify, to, to set yourself apart, to, to change who you are, to, to shift your thinking. Say shift. Make sure you get the F in there. All right, shift your thinking. Okay, so sh- shift your thinking. You get your, sh- your, your, your thinking, and you're going, all right, God, I'm setting myself apart. How many guys have ever, you, you're, you needed God to do something, and you knew usually when things aren't going your way, you do this, but because you're, you're needing God to do this, you're going to change something today. Anybody ever been there before? How many guys have ever, you, uh, every, in your past, every moment where things got hard, you started to lean in to, to this behavior, this character. Every time things got hard, you went and did this, and you knew it wasn't what God wanted for you, but it was just kind of part of who you were. It was a struggle that you had. All right, God, I'm struggling with this, and you would go out and make this decision, but this, there was one moment where you were believing, all right, God, you're going to do something different. I'm believing you're going to do something different, and you're going, all right, instead of doing this, this time I'm going to do this. Anybody ever been there before? You were consecrating yourself. You were setting yourself apart and saying, I usually go here, but God, I'm putting my faith in you, and I know you would want me to go here, so I'm going to do this instead. And they're saying, consecrate yourselves because tomorrow the Lord's going to do amazing things. Listen, consecrate or be faithful in action or spirit today with faith in God for tomorrow. That's what he's saying. Be faithful in action and spirit today, believing that God's going to do something tomorrow. 
right? And the difference here that we have to understand, listen to me, because our behavior matters. I'm going to say that again. Our behavior matters. So the best security for tomorrow's wonders is today's consecration. I'm going to say it again. The best security for seeing God do something amazing tomorrow is setting ourselves apart from the world today. The best way to ensure you see God moving in your tomorrow is to fall in line with who God wants you to be today. Because now you've made the decision to not just believe, but to put action to your belief. And that's where God knows we're for real, right? God, I put this in your notes, but God can produce favor in the places you once lacked faith. God can produce favor in the places you once lacked faith. God, I don't know if you can still do this in this relationship. I don't know if you can do this at this job. I don't know if you can. Listen, God can produce favor in places you once lacked faith. Because God can do things even when we can't see how he can do things. That's why Psalms 23, 1 through 6, I'm not going to read all of it, but there's, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Anybody ever heard that, verse, that, that passage before? It was in your grandma's kitchen. Okay, so the Lord is my shepherd, shall not want. Or like over her toilet or something. Like y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't mean I don't want the Lord. It means the Lord is my shepherd. I shouldn't want for anything else since I have him. That's what it means, okay, just to help you out. Later on, it goes to say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I want you to think about that for a second, because if you're surrounded by enemies, what's the last thing you're thinking about doing? Eating. The last thing you want to do is kick back in your recliner when you're surrounded by people that want to kill you. Well, like a tombstone, because them hit different than a recliner. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anyway, so like... (laughs) The last thing you're thinking about, it's like, let me just relax when you're surrounded by people that want to destroy you. And that's what he's saying. You prepare a table for me to feast and have peace, even though I'm surrounded by circumstances that are peaceless. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hear me, hear this. You anoint my head with oil. In other words, you set me apart and call me to something greater. My cup overflows. In other words, everything you're doing in my life becomes so abundant, I can't even contain it anymore. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. How many guys want that life that looks like that? I do. Because I, to me, that's the blessed life. And so, Joshua 3, 9 through 11, this isn't on the screen, but what's happening is, is God's makes a promise in Joshua 3, 9 through 11, because the Israelites are getting ready to cross this body of water. But as they're getting ready to cross the body of water, there's enemies on the other side that are waiting to destroy them as soon as they get across. So as soon as they, not different than the Red Sea, where the armies were behind them, this time the armies are in front of them. They're getting ready to cross over. And as they're getting ready to cross over, they're looking at armies on the other side that are just waiting on them to cross over so they can kill them. Could you imagine swimming like two miles and then get to the other side and someone's like, ah, boom. It's like, I'll stay over here. Because how many guys understand when you don't know how the, it's going to work on the other side, you're tempted to stay where you're at. And so God says, I'll take care of the enemies. If you look at verse 9 through 11, that's what it is. I'll take care of the enemies. I'll wipe them out so that you can move forward. Right? And so they get ready. They get across the waters. But hear me, getting across wasn't about the waters parting, it was about the promised land. For so many of us, our life looks similar to the Israelites' journey, not that we're wandering around in the desert literally, but some of us do feel like we've been wandering around it emotionally, financially, spiritually. We know what it feels like to be in dry places, don't we? We know what it feels like to not know if God's going to get us through. We know what it feels like to feel like to think we were going into the season for a couple days and find out two and a half years later we're still here. We know what it feels like to navigate waters. We also know what it feels like to know God did something miraculous then, but not be certain on how He's going to do it now. 
See, we're a lot more like them than we realize. One hurdle after another, wandering in the desert. And if we're careful, here's how we can find ourselves. We can find ourselves similar to them like this, where we just say, God, I just need you to get me through this. Anybody relate? Has anybody ever lost sight of the big picture because you just needed God to get you through today? Anybody ever lost sight of the grandness of what God was trying to do? You're just like, God, if you could just make sure I make it home today without killing someone. God, if you could just get me. Why? It's so easy to lose sight of the promised land when we're just looking for waters to part. But it's important to understand that God has something big in front of us. Why? Because God's favor in your life doesn't have to be situational. It can be covenantal. See, sometimes we start looking for God's favor in our life to just show up situationally. God, just get me through this. I, I tithed a couple weeks ago. Just get, if, you can just, if you can just get this bill paid. God's going, that's not how this works. I mean, it is, but it isn't. God's saying, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in something way bigger than that for you. I'm interested in a blessed life for you. I'm interested in favor for you. Yeah, you may need this little thing, but this little thing needs to be connected to the big thing that God wants for you. The grandness that God has in your life. We go to Joshua 3, 12 through 13, picking up on the story. Now then, Joshua's saying, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who are carrying the ark of the Lord, remember we talked about that, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And he says, you'll be able to cross on dry ground. And so they do. But here's what I want you to understand. Listen to me. This is what we're talking about when we talk about bridge builders. Say bridge builders. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't all of Israel that needed to step and put their foot in the ground. They needed one person from each camp to put their foot in the ground. Could you imagine the responsibility placed on you in that moment? Like God comes to you and is like, hey, listen, Charity, the weight of your whole tribe is on your shoulders. <laughs> Be like, mm, you want to pick somebody else? Or like, could you imagine God comes to you, hey, there's about 20,000 people back there. The weight of all of them is on your shoulders. So I just need you to act in faith. Be like, I wasn't sure if he was going to do a thing yesterday. They're like, yeah, but I need you to have a lot of faith today. It's like, mm. And if I don't, anybody ever been there before? What if, what if we just don't, what if we skip that part today? Maybe tomorrow I'll feel better. Anybody? He said, I want you to pick one person from every tribe to be the one to put their foot forward first, to be the one that would bridge the gap between where I am and where I'm taking them. Hear me. For some of you, God is saying right now, on behalf of you, on behalf of your marriage, on behalf of your home, on behalf of your children, on behalf of your legacy, on behalf of everything that God is asking you to do, listen to me, God is looking at some of us and saying, I'm asking you to be the one to break everything that used to be and set a new tone for what I want it to be. I'm looking for you to be the first person to say no to that addiction when every generation before you has said yes to that addiction. I'm looking for you to be the first one to start saying no to that anger problem when your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather and your great-great-grandfather, I know they did it, but I'm looking for someone to bridge the gap between where I was and where I have you to be. I want you to be the one that bridges the gap between what you used to have and who you have now. I want you to be the one to bridge the gap between who you're family has always been and who I'm asking your family to be. I want you to be the one to bridge the gap. I know, ladies, I know that your, your mom was this way and your great grandma was this way and generations of your, of your lineage and of your family, they've had this same thing in their life, but I'm looking for you to have the faith to break what everything else has just been normal. Are you willing to bridge the gap between the life that you have and the life that God wants you to have? What if you became the bridge builder? Listen, nobody knows, this is in your notes, nobody knows they can truly give God faithfulness and obedience until they do. And then God comes through. How many guys like to have an insurance policy when you're doing something crazy? Right? Anybody ever rented a car before out of town and you knew what was about to happen? Come on. Remember when you were 23? 
And you're like, hey, yeah, I know y'all got that minivan, but do you have a Dodge Challenger by chance? And I definitely want to add that insurance policy for $10. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, that's what I thought. In our life with God, sometimes we're always looking for an insurance policy. I'm going to do this, but I need to see something from you first, God. And God's saying, no, 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 I'm going to do this. I need to see something from you first. And so we're saying, yes. But hear me, Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And for, for many of us, it's not about money, but for many of us, that's the area we have the greatest problem with God. And hear me, I'm, I'm, I, I, I never preach on money here, A, because our church is incredibly generous, and I'm not preaching about money today, but I do want to show you how the favor of God works, if you'll give me just a minute. Can I do that? Because I do want to show you how the favor of God works, right? In Malachi 3, I'm not going to read all the passages. Malachi 3, 8 through 12, you can go read it. God says, why are you, why are you robbing me? And they go, why, how, how have we robbed you? And God says, because you're not giving me the tithes and the offerings that are for me. And he said, God says, if you'll give it to me, I'll bless you. Remember, blessed? If you, if you give to me, you're not giving to your pastor, you're not giving to your church, you're giving to God, you're just doing it through your, your local church. In Malachi 3, it's all there, all right? Just for the sake of time. It says, if you give to me, I will open the floodgates of heaven and pull out a blessing you cannot contain. That's the promise of God, all right? As a matter of fact, just to help any person that's like, I don't know how I feel about this. If you're here, but you belong to a different church, don't give us money today. Because this isn't your house. Somewhere else is. So if you think I'm just up here trying to talk about money, I'm telling people, if this isn't your house, your money doesn't belong here. It belongs at your house. Okay? But just to make sure we're clear on how this works, I'm gonna, I want to kind of help someone. Kayla, will you come up here? You just look like you're ready. Come on up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So I just want to help, I want to help you guys understand how all of this works, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give Kayla a cup. Boom. All right. So I'm going to, Kayla, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to say, all right, Kayla, I'm going to give you some of this. How many is in there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You got ten, you got ten ping pong balls there, Kayla. Now, you can keep those ten. You can keep the ten. Online, you can keep 10. People in the room, you can keep 10. If you give me 10% of that back, because a tithe literally means a tenth. That's all it means. If you give me 10% of that back, which would just be one, you'll be in a covenant with me and I'll give you more. How does that sound? <laughs> okay. But, but what, if, what, if, what, if what, all, what if the 10 is what's required for you to do everything you need to do? Is it still worth it to give it back? All right, then, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I want you to take, here, just, right. There's, having a hard time containing that, aren't you? So now you got 20. Do you want to give two back? You want to give two? Here, I'll just take these two off the top, right? I know it's hard, right? But since you gave two back, we're in a covenant again. So here, just... So, right, because, because listen to me. When we're faithful with little, God will make us rulers over. Listen, right? What do you think David meant when he said, My cup overflows? The favor of God keeps showing up in my life, and I can't even contain it anymore. It just keeps on showing up. Why? When we're obedience with when we have obedience with what we have, God shows up to give us what we need. But when we're faithful, even with what we need, God gives us abundance, even when we don't know how it's gonna work. And hear me, I am talking about your finances, but I'm not just talking about your finances. I'm talking about your joy as well. I'm talking about peace in your marriage as well. All right, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm going to start speaking life. God, we're going to start giving you our morning. God, we're going to give you 10 minutes every morning in, in our marriage. We're together. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to pray before we start our day because I'm believing you're going to change something in my marriage because I want it to be different than it was last year, right? Why? I'm changing something. So is it about your finances? Yes. Listen, 
if you don't get, I don't know who gives what to this church. Ask Pastor Justin. I can't see who gives anything. If you gave a dollar, awesome. If you only gave a hundred dollars throughout five years, I don't know that information either. If you gave 10,000, I don't know that information either. I'm not here because I'm trying to convince somebody to give us money. I'm here today to let you know, you can be a bridge builder between where your family has always been and where God wants it to be, but it is up to us to say yes. I'll take that. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate you. It is up to us to say yes. And so I want to give you this real quick, and we're going to shut down today. Steps to becoming a bridge builder. I felt like last week was extremely helpful because we gave you some steps, and, and this is a very practical series, so I just want to give it to you, all right? Steps to becoming a bridge builder. Number one, reflect on God's promises. Reflect on God's promises. Remember how God promised he'd never leave you nor forsake you and then you found yourselves in moments where you thought he was gonna leave you and forsake you and then he showed up again and didn't leave you or forsake you? Reflect on God's promises. Number two, remind yourself of the life you want to have. Listen to me. Everything in your life is reminding you of the life you currently have. I'm asking you to remind yourself of the life you want to have. I'm not talking about a yacht or a million dollars. I'm talking about a financial peace, a marriage that's healthy, kids that love God. Remind yourself of the life you want to have. Joy when I wake up in the morning. Remind yourself of the life you want to have because the whole world is trying to give you the life you currently have. Remind yourself of the life you want to have. Number three, reinforce your commitment to walk it out. Say reinforce. Reinforce your commitment to walk it out. You want to know why you got to reinforce that? Because tomorrow you may not feel the same way you feel today. Come on. So you got to reinforce it. No, 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 no. This is where I want to be. Right? Me and my wife, we're, I drive a 2008 Tundra, okay? That bad boy is it, 14 years old now. It still runs. That's why I still got it, okay? Me and my wife were talking last year. I said, you know, pastors don't want to have 401Ks for the record. Right? I was like, we should really be thinking about the future at some point. And so we started saying, maybe we should start investing and taking care of us and, and just looking at a few things. She said, if we're going to invest, you can't get a new car. And I had to make a decision. And how many guys know every time that Infinity commercial comes on TV, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I don't need to invest. <laughs> maybe I need that new car. But that's when I got to reinforce my commitment to walk out where I know I want to be versus just what I want today. It's important. Number four, remember God's instructions. You're looking for favor, remember God's instructions. Number five, receive God's favor. Remember, what does the word blessed mean? Kneeling under the open hands of God for his favor. And then number six, last but not least, reinvest in God's kingdom. Because when we invest in God's kingdom, you know what we've done? We've reestablished the covenant. And here's the unique part about number six. Listen to me, we're almost done. We're gonna wrap this up. The unique part about number six is it puts you right back to number one. Look at it. Reinvest in God's kingdom. Well, what have you just done? You just bought back into the covenant. Well, guess what you get to do now? Reflect on God's promises. All right, God, I'm saying yes. I'm reinvesting in your kingdom. All right, so now I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna reflect on who you are, who your promises are, and then what are we gonna do, right? I'm gonna remind myself of the life I wanna live. We're gonna walk it out. We're gonna, right, what happens? You get into the cycle, and hear me, the people that get to experience the overflow are the ones that never step out of the cycle. Because hear me, doing nothing and changing nothing means you get nothing and change nothing. Doing something means you get something, but if you stop doing something, now you get nothing. Right? And I'm, again, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about everything else in our life. Let's start saying yes to God. Why? Bridge builders are set apart to be faithful, obedient, generous, and sacrificial, right? And as long as you're a bridge builder between where you are and where you want to be, as long as you're a bridge builder, you will remain in God's favor. You guys ready to remain in God's favor today? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you're doing in our life, God, and how you continually hold us and carry us. And so, God, we look to you 
to be everything that we need today, we're grateful for you. God, I pray for each person that's gonna start saying yes, maybe to giving financially, maybe to praying with their spouse each day before they go to work. Maybe it's gonna be something for their marriage, something for their finances, something for their children. Something, maybe it's gonna be praying with their children out loud before they go to school every day. Maybe it's gonna be uh, praying, God, when they get to work, that they would be an influence in their workplace. Whatever it is, God, I pray that you would let your covenant release in their life as they say yes and are obedient to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for that. Quickly, if you're here today and you need the forgiveness of God in your life, because you know there's sin in your life that separates you from God, but you're ready to say yes to God and let him wipe that away. Repenting and turning away from sin. Saying, I'm not gonna live that life anymore, but asking God to give you forgiveness so you can pursue a life with him. If that's you, I wanna invite you to quickly and very easily say this prayer with me and the rest of the church will pray with you. Say, dear God, forgive me. I believe, Jesus, that you died for me, so I give you my life. Make me new and make me whole. I'll follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.